We're gonna switch gears a little bit. We've had some great setup and really kind of focus on the uh, biological and organic part of um, soil management and things that you can do in terms of managing your soils that help with that biology piece that um, we heard about. Um, I think it's really pretty striking that we're talking about soil microbes in just about every one of these sessions. I think, again, if you go back in time, I don't think too many people 20 years were talking about soil microbes, but I think there's an increasing recognition of the important role that um, the fungi and bacteria play in the soils in terms of um, nutrient cycling, making that very expensive fertilizer that you put on your trees more bioavailable and um, soluble in the soil, helping combat some of the multitude of soil pests, which can be um, of, of nematodes, uh, bacterial, and other fungi. Um, in the soil structure as well, and the, the, the properties around um, how that soil holds water. So I think Bill said it, uh, Bill Brush in his video said it really nicely, the microbes eat first, and that's value to you, because those microbes are particularly important for all those reasons I just outlined. And then um, Ben also talked about soil testing and maximizing roots. And so um, I'll start off with a little science, and then we're going to turn it over for a little more research and then a lot of uh, actual in the orchard experience to top on that. So there's a variety of different organic um, amendments that you can use in almond orchards. And we're doing research or have done research on all of them. So you'll hear a lot about cover crops today. Um, some really important research that shows that um, Having um, more continuous coverage, more roots in the soils in an almond orchard is correlated with some of those really positive mycorrhizal fungi that are associated with the almond tree roots and help with some of those properties like nutrient cycling, combating soil pests, and so forth. Um, so that's research in almonds. We're going to hear about research in this region in cover crops. We know that Cover crops is not something that works in all orchards every year um, because of our irrigation systems and the paucity of rainfall some years in the entire state and some years in certainly the southern San Joaquin Valley. In addition to cover crops, there's compost application. We have done research on compost as well, and we have some um, additional research that's just getting started this year. Um, mixed results in terms of actual yield benefits for compost, but some good evidence um, that it can be an important way to achieve some of the nutrients that you need in the orchard. Virginia Jameson from CDFA talked about the Healthy Soils Program that the state has to provide incentives. Um, I think the Healthy Soils Grants covers most, uh, more than half, uh, and almost all of the cost of compost applications. And that's actually the number one practice that almond growers in particular have been applying for those grant funds. And of course, as uh, we've seen the spike in fertilizer prices, a lot of growers have been trying to look at organic amendments like compost as a added tool. Then we have things like whole orchard recycling, which we won't have. Uh, I'll try to summarize a little bit of the science when we get into that, but there is no practice that can add that much organic matter in such uh, short time. Obviously, you only do it once in the life of an orchard when you take an orchard out and plant a new one, um, but um, a really valuable practice and expensive and logistically sometimes complex, but a valuable practice when it comes to adding significant organic matter and really um, giving a shot in the arm in that soil for the next orchard. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So broad overview, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Joy Hollingsworth, who just sits across the street, very familiar with this region, and we'll talk a little bit about cover crops in this region. Okay, uh, thanks, Suzette. Thanks so much. Ooh, sorry, that's loud. Um, for inviting me, I'm Joy Hollingsworth. I'm a Cooperative Extension Advisor, um, as Josette said, right across the street in Tulare County and Kings. Um, Briefly, I actually haven't worked too much in almonds. I'm actually the table grape advisor, but my background has been really broad. I've worked in a lot of different cropping systems over the years, and um, in my previous job, I was the soils and nutrient advisor for several years. Um, I thought it was interesting just now, Josette had mentioned that 20 years ago, we weren't really talking about microbes. 
I can say 15 years ago, we weren't really talking too much about cover crops. I was working for the Community Alliance with Family Farmers at the time, and we were trying to introduce tree growers to cover crops and trying to get the BIOS program going. And it was kind of a hard sell. So it's been really exciting over the years to see how much that's changed. I feel like I hear about cover crops all the time now. Uh, so in, um, in my, as I said, my previous position as the soils advisor, uh, my colleagues and I had been hearing from a lot of growers a uh, really strong interest in cover crops, but understandably very concerned about their water usage, especially here in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, a lot of the previous trials and cover crops have been either in Northern California or in other states where they get a lot more rainfall. And very understandably, there's a lot of concern. We're in the drought, there's sigma regulations, no one wants to use more water than they have to. And can you actually have a cover crop if it's not gonna rain or rain very minimally? Um, so we were curious. Uh, we understand that uh, a grower might, want to, might not want to take that risk, but as researchers, we can do that. So we decided to plant kind of a demonstration trial, very small, not really funded, just to see what would happen. So it was really important to us we, uh, to do this here locally. We planted our trial at the Kearney Ag Center over in Parlier. So this was in um, the fall of 2020. We actually got a little bit of a late start. We ended up planting in um, mid-December and uh, we planted a couple different cover crop mixes and we wanted to see, compare with irrigation and without irrigation. And even when we irrigated, we want to irrigate very minimally. So even the irrigated plots only got four inches of extra water. And um, it was a really light year that year. It only rained about three, yeah, 3.3 inches of rain between when we planted in mid-December and when we terminated the cover crop in um, the end of March. And I should say, um, again, this wasn't in almonds. This was just in an open field at Kearney. Um, but we, we just wanted to see what would happen. So again, we planted a couple different mixes. Um, one of them was rye and peas. One was a soil health uh, mix, which um, I think I had four different species, including some radish and some grasses and legumes. And so we have found like we got a decent stand. So the, um, so the irrigated rye and peas, we estimated we got about 3,000 pounds of biomass per acre. The plants were around two feet tall. Uh, the soil health mix was just a little bit smaller. Um, it was about maybe 20 inches tall and I got about 16, 1,500 pounds. It was interesting, some of the species, it didn't seem to matter if they got those additional four inches of water. The soil builder mix was pretty similar. You can see between 15, 1,600 pounds. The Ryan peas actually did make a significant difference. Um, but yeah, so we, we were pretty happy with that result. Uh, at the same time, a colleague of ours, uh, Shulamit Schroeder, uh, who was working at Shafter at the time, did a very similar study. She got a head start on us. She actually planted in early November, and she did a much better job of actually prepping the ground. They pre-irrigated, they, then they tilled up the weeds, and then they planted the first week of November. So she got about a six-week head start on us. She got so much biomass, I couldn't believe. Her plots were like five feet tall. And again, you can see at the top there, they got only two inches of rain, and even the, on the higher irrigation side, only 2.7 inches of water or of irrigation. So um, you can see the different um, mixes she had there, a soil health or soil builder mix, soil health, uh, barley and veg, rye and peas, and Nebraska's. Uh, they produce, like, I think it was on average 10,000 to 20,000 pounds of biomass per acre that she estimated. Again, these are small plots, so she had to estimate up, but we were, I, how do you think, back there um, helped harvest and these plants were massive. Uh, probably way more than you would actually want in a realistic setting, but just really interesting to see what you can do in shafter on very minimal rainfall. Um, so this was just one year, but we just wanted to see this is more of a demonstration than anything else. So uh, the second year we planted at Kearney, again, we mixed it up a little bit. Um, so this was planted in the first week of December of 2021 and then terminated at the end of March in 2022. We got a little more rain that year. We got about 5.7 inches of rain. And so we irrigated less. We only irrigated about an inch. Um, I don't know if it's just that we got an earlier start or we did a better job planting, but we got significantly more biomass. The rye and vetch, we averaged about 8,000 pounds per acre and the uh, soil builder about 6,000 pounds per acre. The rye was about five feet tall in a lot of plots, and um, the soil builder was around four feet tall. So again, probably more biomass than you would re realistically have. You probably wouldn't let it go to seed unless you're looking for pollination services, which you might be in your almond orchards. Um, but again, so very minimal rainfall. 
And this trial in the second year, we also, we did a couple different things besides the different mixes. We actually, I don't have the pictures of it, but we had a native plant mix that we got that was all local native seeds that were um, used to this area. So we we're less biomass, but really interesting to see how that would work. We had two different planting types. We used a drill seeder in some of the plots and we used a broadcast seed to see how that would affect the plots. And then we also had two different termination types. Uh, so the key findings over the last couple, over those years, um, we, so we were pretty happy. We got, I think, a decent cover crop, was very minimal rainfall, and most of that was, or very minimal ear water, most of that was rainfall. We did find some mixes did better than others with drilled versus broadcast. The, um, I think the rye and vetch, it didn't matter whether it was drilled or broadcast, but the soil builder definitely made a big difference. It did much better when it was drilled. I think probably because the seeds were a lot bigger, so they didn't take to broadcasting very well. Uh, ryegrass in general, and the and kernel in particular, did very well as a cover crop. Then, the, so the last thing we did was we terminated terminated it differently. We um, mowed some plots and left the residue on the soil, and then we disked some plots. And we found that the um, mowed plots did better as far as water infiltration. The water infiltration was much faster. And in uh, we went back a month later, and we were curious about soil temperature. So a month after termination, we used an infrared thermometer to measure the soil temperature, and it was like 20 degrees cooler in the, in the mode plots that kept the residue than with the disc plots. So that was really interesting to see. I don't know in an almond orchard if this was a, affect you guys as much when you already have um, a really large canopy, but in an open field, a 20 degree Fahrenheit difference in soil temperature was pretty amazing. I think it's got really great implications for soil water usage with evapotranspiration uh, rates. Uh, so the other thing I want to touch on was not research that I did, but research uh, that's being done in the UC. This was uh, work done by Alyssa DeVincentes as part of her master's thesis, or sorry, her PhD thesis at UC Davis, along with a lot of really great uh, UC researchers who have been doing cover crop work for a long time. I think uh, Jeff Mitchell and Daniele Zachariah were involved in this work. This was a much bigger study. Um, this was done between 2016 and 2019. They had 10 research um, uh, locations throughout the state, all the way from Chico down to Arvin. So they were really looking at um, this water usage of a crop, cover crops. This is a really big issue that we're facing right now. There are a lot of people saying cover crops use too much water, Well, they, but no one's quantifying it. So they went through and that's what they did. They um, had almond sites and tomato sites in these 10 different locations. They were looking at soil moisture differences between the cover cropped areas and the non-cover cropped areas. And they actually found there was no significant difference um, between uh, the water, the soil moisture. They also looked at evapotranspiration, I think maybe in two of the sites, and um, the ET losses were minimal. So overall, this suggests that the winter cover crops um, in the Central Valley may break even in terms of consumptive water use. So this is really huge. This is really recent research that's really critical right now. Uh, so I just wanted to link to a couple sites if you wanted to get more details on um, the work that I reported, also the last link is the um, best management practices that's over there on the table and Josette has right here. And so again, thanks so much Josette for inviting me to talk about this. I think this is such a really interesting area and I'm happy to hear this discussion. As Joy mentioned, you can pick up a copy of the cover crop best management guide for almonds. It's based on a lot of research, interviews with growers, PCAs, uh, cooperative extension, so a lot of very practical information on how to evaluate with, whether there will be benefits from a cover crop and then how to do a cover crop from start to finish, where to find seed, how to pick your seed mix, how to plant, whether you use drill, broadcast, a variety of ways of doing that, um, how to terminate, how to control pest um, related issues and so forth. So really hopefully a useful resource. So as I talked before, uh, the um, All On Board, I think, does a really nice job, hopefully, of uh, having science-based information, like you just heard, making sure there's rigorous research to answer questions in an objective um, way. But that also, it's also really important to talk to practitioners, people who are doing this, to ensure that that practical stuff gets mixed into any kind of guidance we put out or even the kind of research we do to make sure that it's, it's um, really applicable. So we have two people who uh, actually manage orchards um, to talk a little bit about their experience. And maybe I'll start off with you, Donnie. 
if you could talk a little bit, maybe just give people a sense of your operation and on the growing side, because you have two jobs in our industry. And then uh, what your experience has been with cover crops, why you thought about applying them and what you've experienced so far. Okay. Yeah, uh, again, I'm Donnie Hicks. Um, we're um, a small grower in Houston. My wife and I have 18 acres of uh, independence in Shasta and uh, on our home place. So not a very big grower, but uh, I also work in grower relations for our pack. So I deal with a lot of growers and uh, get to see a lot of different things going on in their orchards. So my motivation for um, planting a cover crop uh, first came about because my wife is a bee broker and wanted to look at the benefits for having bees uh, having uh, food for the bees prior to bloom and, and post bloom. So that piqued my interest. And then also I, we have a sandy hampered loam, which is great soil. But uh, when we get into the later summer months, the soil seems to close up and I can't get the water to infiltrate uh, past about a foot. So had a problem there. I've tried suffractants, I've tried all kinds of different things and they do work for a little bit, but ultimately, you know, you have that problem. So I heard that cover crop would help that. So uh, it was, uh, this is my second year of doing it. The first year, um, I was a little bit late getting started. Uh, I had to work the field because I'd rutted it up through the years. And I thought, you know, this might be a good time to start. So I called Billy at AFSM. And again, it was a little bit late to get in the program, but he said, no problem, we can get you in. And I told him what my concerns were with the uh, soil, and he gave me a soil building uh, seed mix. They brought it out. We had, uh, it was in October, we had some storms on uh, in the forecast. So I wanted to get it in as soon as I could. But the grain drill uh, guy was busy. So, so I said, okay, I'll do it myself. Um, uh, so I, I worked the ground, got a spreader um, on the back of my ATV. It's only 18 acres, so not a whole lot. So I fill it up, get ready to go out, and uh, nothing happens. I'm like, pull it out, there was a bean cotton. <laughs> so a little bit big for using that. And uh, so I wouldn't suggest doing what I did next, but being an old wrestler, I thought I can, I can handle this. I grabbed my uh, lawn spreader. And so I walked the whole 18 acres spreading the seed. And uh, again, I wouldn't suggest doing that, uh, but on small acreage, it worked out for me. We got the storm a couple of days later. Well, I harrowed it in after that. A couple of days later, uh, we had the storm, two inches of rain, and I had a pretty good stand. And I think that uh, 21, we were around uh, eight inches of, of water, of rain that year. So it, it turned out pretty good. Um, and then we got to bloom, the bees came out, so they had some food. And so as we've had for the past few years, uh, frost and forecast. So I was a little concerned. I went out and I mowed it, terminated it by mowing it. And um, uh, yeah, we went through the, uh, the rest of the year. I, I, did, I think I then uh, disked and then floated everything out. Um, one of the benefits I saw initially, uh, yeah, the water did infiltrate a little bit better. Um, and uh, with that sandy loam, it's hard to keep the uh, organic matter up on it. And I did see it go from uh, about a half a percent up to one percent. So that was a benefit from it. Um, so going into this year, I had everything lined up. I was ready to go. So uh, they gave me a... Um, uh, brassica mix this year we changed up and I was able to get a guy to come in and, and put it in with the no-till uh, drain, uh, uh, drain drill and uh, I kept one flood irrigation on the books so I could get it flooded in we uh, he planted it in about 45 minutes on uh, September 22nd so I got a good early start on it irrigated it and man I had a stand, and with and with the rain we had this year, yeah, five feet tall, yeah. <laughs> it was not 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 much. I'm not a very tall guy. Some of it was over my head though. Uh, so one of the greatest benefit this year that I've seen so far is that um, uh, we were able to mummy shake um, 
when in December when my neighbor's fields were flooded and I didn't have any flooding, so we were able to winter shake. Um, I was able to get four, yeah, four bloom sprays on where uh, there was one situation, my neighbor and I used the same uh, spraying service and we were in Texas and um, I get a call from the, the folks that are spraying. They said, hey, we're, we're stuck in your neighbor's orchard. And uh, I said, hey, I'm in Texas, can't do much. So they, they got him out. They said, how about your place? I said, well, give it a try. They went through, no problems. So uh, that was a great benefit. And uh, the mummy shaking, you know, mummies deteriorated and yeah. So, so I'm anxious to see, well, yeah, here was another. So we rode a tilt this year because uh, we did track it up um, the ground and I put on three flood irrigations and so far within 12, 24 hours, the water's totally gone. So my infiltration problems look okay right now, but we haven't really got hot. So waiting to see how it goes, but this is just year two. And uh, I definitely plan to do this every year, especially after this uh, wet, wet winter that we had. So I, I would encourage growers out there, you know, small, big, it, it's definitely worth your while uh, to do cover crops, not just for the pollinator benefits, but you know, the soil benefits as well. So, yep. Great. Well, thanks. It's great to hear your yeah. your practical experience. And and in the next panel, we'll have a speaker from Project APSM to talk about the opportunity to access some free and or discounted um, cover crop seed that helped you get started. Um, and you reiterate a couple points that I hear a lot with growers that soil compaction is probably the number one reason that people think about cover crops and continue with it. Um, and as you said, the other is access to the orchard in the winter. Having that living cover um, makes it easier to get equipment in to do mummy shake or uh, bloom sprays. And um, yeah, this year was a particularly bad year for that problem. Well, we'll go from a 18 acre to, I don't know how many acres, but a lot, um, and turn to you, Zach. You guys, uh, I think, are going to be my poster child for trying all of these different uh, soil organic practices from cover crops to compost to whole orchard recycling and maybe some other things. So maybe just talk a little bit about what you guys are doing on your operation and why and what your experience has been. Thank you. First off, I do have to say, if you want uh, good information, you should follow Donnie on LinkedIn because oh, yeah. he always has great pictures, great descriptions. Um, even a you know, big corporate farmer, I'm always looking to see what, what Donnie said next. So great information, very practical. Um, yeah, I'm Zach Ellis, Senior Director of Agronomy with Almond Food Ingredients. We manage 14,000 acres, mostly almonds. We also have some pistachios and a little bit of walnuts, which we don't really like to talk about. Uh, and we've done a lot in, in cover cropping. You know, we, we kind of came on the approach of pollinator habitat, not soil compaction initially. And I think seven years ago, when I was just starting with Olam, we were one of the first orchards that developed different trial work on the Xerxes Society and what mixes of cover crops they wanted to, to deploy commercially to their certified uh, body. So, you know, right out of the gate, we were doing trials on different types of mixes, planting depths, how to irrigate, when to irrigate, you know, when, when to plant. Um, it was, it was a, like drinking out of a fire hose for a long time. So over the years, we've really tried to understand why we're doing these things and, and what the benefit is. Initially, it was pollinator habitat, right? It was making sure that we had these beneficials that had a, a good home that, uh, that they could hopefully help us protect uh, our crop, uh, as, as well as the honeybees, honeybees coming in, making sure that they have a diverse diet, that they have refuge, clean water, all those good things. As we went through that, we realized that cover crop is great, but there is always a limiting factor. And what we really realize is that if we use IPM approaches truly and unconditionally, if we made sure that we weren't using products like abamectin in the spring, just because we like abamectin and it's cheap, or using pyrethroids all year long and killing our beneficials, we really saw a huge difference in our ability to control specific pests most specifically the two-spotted spider mite. So as we would go through, you know, we planted 
for the beneficials. But what we were seeing is that by eliminating some of these harmful pesticides like abamectin and pyrethroids, in addition to permanent and annual cover crop, we could see a huge increase in six spotted thrip. And over two or three years of doing that consistently, now we don't spray for mites. We just don't spray for mites. Even at whole split, there's no miticide in the tank. And those are only on orchards that took several years to build up these beneficial populations and to really become a steward of, of that um, overall life cycle of beneficials and how they work, right? So it's really hard to quantify some of these things. A, if you have a, a partner like a corporate does, like Olam, we can get some of these corporate partners to come and, and fund these projects, which is how it really started is getting money to fund some of these things to understand how they work. Now we're seeing a return on investment in reducing our costs and helping with things like infiltration um, and then just getting a premium because now we're, we have this pollinator partnership certification. So now I think we're at 75% of our orchards are, are pollinator partner partnership certified. The other 25% will be done by the end of the year. And that'll mark, I think, three years of pollinator partnership and eight years of some type of certification with these, these different cover crops. So the real learning curve for us though was planting timing, planting depth, cover crop mix, making sure that, that um, where we plant makes a difference. And by doing that, we really do see a huge benefit in a lot of different ways. The biggest issue I see is that it takes multiple years for you to see a lot of these benefits. Because of that, Growers, myself included, are we're not very patient, right? We want things to happen right away. Uh, if it doesn't happen in a year, I'm, I'm tossing it off to the side and I'm going to the next thing. These types of regenerative practices, increasing biodiversity both in the soil and above ground with your pollinators, takes multiple years for it to build. Once you get to that, that critical mass, building that soil health, you see a huge benefit in multitude of ways. Soil health, um, nutrient use efficiencies, we've been able to cut our irrigations without any detriment to our crop. We've been able to reduce our miticide usage. You know, there's just a, a host of things that are now starting to really click for us. So now seeing that, the real question is, okay, that's one component, right? Cover crops is one component. What happens when we stack other regenerative practices onto that, right? So now let's get a whole orchard recycled block. Let's put cover crop on it from day one, but let's also put compost on it from day one. Let's mix a little bit of biochar with that compost and apply that. Now the types of effects that you see, the compounding interest that you, that you start to develop is huge. And that's really what we think is the next iteration of, of sustainable farming and just commercial farming in general. If we wanna be here in the future, we have to become more sustainable and more regenerative. And the real value proposition is not just one thing, but it's, it's stacking multiple things on top of that same orchard and seeing a huge effect uh, from a biodiversity standpoint, from a use efficiency standpoint, from an infiltration standpoint, from a bee health standpoint. There's just a, a lot of things that really, uh, they make a huge difference. So we're excited about it. We're very, very bullish on it. All the orchards are doing it. Uh, you know, there's a huge learning curve on the timing and the depth and the how and this and that. But those are all answers that we can get. Those are all problems that can be solved. It's just a matter of letting that process happen. And unfortunately, it's a slow process. So uh, once you get there, you see the light and, and that's where we're at. You know, we're, we have rose, rose colored glasses on right now because we're seeing some of this start to uh, come to fruition for us. But it was not easy. And, and uh, but, you know, like they say, the juice is worth the squeeze. And we really we've seen the, uh, the benefit so far. Great. Well, we're going to open it up to questions. I want to make sure you get a chance to talk to some of your peers on on their experiences there. Just uh, wanted to also mention um, on whole orchard recycling. We also have a guide on that over there. Um, and um, just to reiterate, um, you know, if you have the opportunity to consider this practice, it's really a um, sea change in terms of the soil and then in terms of the 
orchard that you plant afterwards. So in the research that was done over the course of more than 10 years now, and we even have ongoing research to monitor several orchards many years down the, run, the road, but in the initial uh, research sites where they took 30 tons of woody biomass, that's 30 tons of organic matter that that orchard represent, chipped it and put it into the soil. I don't know how many years of cover cropping it would take you to get to 30 tons of organic matter, but a, per acre, that, but many, many years, I think we would hear. As Bill Brush said in his video, it's really hard to move the needle dramatically on your soil organic matter. You need the biology, but it takes time, and it takes time then to see the results. What whole orchard recycling does is kind of speeds up some of that and deep into the soil. So some of the research shows that you increase the soil organic matter by 42%. That's pretty huge. Um, and the water holding capacity by 32%. So as we've heard already, the, the cover crops have a, do not have a negative impact on your water use in the orchard. And there is some more ongoing research to address that question. Really important question. We want to make sure we're rock solid in helping growers understand um, that that's not a trade-off that they're making. Make sure policymakers, um, as we go into the world of Sigma, to disadvantage the use of cover crops. But 32% water holding capacity translates into increased water use efficiency in the next orchard. And over a five-year period, the next orchard in these sites had a, had a cumulative yield increase of 19%. So those are some really spectacular numbers. It is not a cheap practice. Um, there are very important incentives that you should be taking advantage of through NRCS, through air quality management districts, uh, through the Healthy Soils Program. Uh, that is an eligible practice. Again, you can go to the Almond Board website under Grower Tools, and there's an incentive page to help defray some of those costs. So definitely hope you pick up that one as well. So wanted to open it up for questions um, from the audience for this group. Sorry, I missed the very first part. So you're looking at cost sharing for a practice is about thirty thousand dollars. Oh, a seed driller, a drill seeder. Um, so we ourselves don't have a program on that, but I do know that Project Apis M, uh, who you will hear from on the next panel, and who has a thing, uh, a table in the back, have purchased a drill seeder that they're hoping to modify to fit in almond orchards. Um, I believe maybe some resource conservation districts might also have access to some equipment, so that would be another place to check. But that is certainly an issue. I will also say there are other methods besides just topical broad seeding that you can find in the cover crop guide. I've heard of people using a chain link fence to sort of disrupt the, the very surface of the soil, pulled behind a an ATV, and then they seed into that and then um, get a little bit better coverage that way. So there's a variety of different application methods. Definitely renting, I mean, owning a drill seeder is not in most people's um, book, but there's, you know, people you can hire, a few other places. But I'd also suggest talk to Project APSM. I'd just like to say that, um, yeah, the with the drain grill, or uh, rain drill, <laughs> It was uh, for the 18 acres, I think I, he charged me 450 bucks. And most of that was because it was such small acreage. So very inexpensive, yeah. I think, I think there also is an effort right now with uh, CAF um, and UC to fund um, an equipment source for small growers in particular. Um, yep. that, that's in the works still. Any other questions? Yeah, so the definitely the two biggest concerns other than the cost and getting equipment out there if you're a small grower are, um, you know, what if there's any disease in the tree and you've now put all that diseased wood in the soil? Are there problems in the next orchard? And then um, we do know that you need to increase the nitrogen fertilization rate for, I believe it's the first year at least, um, because you have so much uh, carbon that you've now added into the soil. So I do believe that the whole orchard recycling guide addresses the nutrient nitrogen management for those first couple of years, but we do have ongoing research 
that is looking at those issues and others um, following multiple orchards around the state, including these uh, initial orchards that are now well over 10 years since they were first recycled. So we will certainly keep that information up to date, um, but so far it does not look like to be a massive problem on the disease side that needs to be addressed and um, very manageable on the nutrients in just terms of putting higher amounts of nitrogen fertilizer at the beginning. And I would say stay tuned on the stacked practices that Zach mentioned, because we do have a project that's just starting this year that is looking at um, any synergies um, or potential trade-offs of stacking multiple practices, so whole orchard recycling, compost, cover crops, biochar, and really looking at the um, implications for the orchard, both from yield to the soil health, um, to, you know, frankly, practical management aspects of um, that orchard in several locations in the state. So a new project that's just getting started and hopefully we'll keep you up to date um, through these kinds of forum or the Almond Conference every year. So that, thanks so much to this panel. Really appreciate all of you coming and I'm going to stay put and invite the next uh, speakers for the final panel before lunch. Thank you very much.